Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out on this beautiful sunny day. Um, I think it's going to be worth your while to be in this uh, darkened auditorium for a little while. Um, we're very much looking forward to Ezra Shale's talk. Um, as has become a tradition here, we open up our public programs with a land acknowledgement. The Des Moines Art Center acknowledges that the land on which we gather is the traditional, ancestral, and unceded land of the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, the Iowa tribe of Oklahoma, and the Meskwaki Nation of the Sac and Fox tribe of the Mississippi. Okay, on to Ezra. Ezra Shales focuses on the, on the productive confusion that lies at the intersection of design and craft and art in everyday life. He teaches the history of design and craft at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design and has a PhD from the Bard Graduate Center and an MFA from Hunter College. He's the author of two books, Made in Newark, which explores craft as an anchor of regional identity in, in the progressive era New Jersey, and um, The Shape of Craft, which is for sale in our museum shop. So if you're interested, you can grab a copy right after the talk. Um, the Shape of Craft has prompted a, a reviewer to identify Ezra as a philosopher of the factory floor. He has published numerous articles and essays on contemporary art, and most recently on Tom Joyce, um, Michael Sherrill, Kim Dickey, and Sherry Mendelson. And he's currently writing introductions for new editions of David Pye's seminal book, The Nature of Design from 1964 and The Nature of Art and Workmanship from 1968. As a curator, he is he has co-organized exhibitions held at the Museum, art, Museum of Art and Design, the Katona Museum of Art, the Alfred Ceramic Art Museum, and the National Museum of Women in the Arts. Please join me in welcoming Ezra. Thank you. It's, it's lovely to be here, and thank you to Allison for inviting me. And, uh, I really, you know, I can't say how impressed I am by the collection, and so it's, it's wonderful, as well as uh, Susan Collis' exhibition. Um, so, so you have a lot, to, a lot to enjoy and be grateful for here. It's great. Um, in many ways, uh, Susan Collis' exhibition really is, is about focusing on everyday life, I'd say, right? She's kind of empties out the gallery to have you think about what isn't there, uh, as well as what is there. Um, and there's also a real quiet uh, to, to, her, uh, to her work, I'd say. Um, and today I'm going to not actually criticize or a critique her, even though uh, I was invited to do so by, by Allison, uh, so much as, as pose a kind of, you know, the, the, you know what about the, the three quarters of everyday life that we don't pay attention to. So uh, you can think of that in, in relationship to the, the famous description of a, of a good sentence alluding to the, the, the rest of the, 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 the iceberg that's underneath the water uh, that we don't think about. <clears throat> I am currently living in uh, Sweden, uh, and uh, it's the birthplace of the self-aligning ball bearing, uh, Gothenburg. Uh, and and uh, it, in, in many ways, I, am, I define myself more as a historian of design, material culture, or contemporary craft more than uh, an art historian. Uh, and, uh, and, and this is what I'm working on now, in fact. What you're seeing is my, my kind of eureka moment where I felt like I discovered the Holy Grail because I was at a, uh, a flea market and two blocks away from the SKF, or if you're Swedish, you pronounce it SQF factory. I found a Swedish-made ball bearing. Uh, they're not made in Sweden anymore, uh, as has happened in America in terms of, uh, of relocation uh, overseas. Uh, you'll find most of uh, your, your SKF ball bearings manufactured elsewhere in the world. Um, and uh, so finding this ball bearing might seem like a kind of what, 
rather pedestrian uh, moment to describe, and yet that to me is the kind of root of all of my work. It is pedestrian. It's this moment where you're, you know, I'm not going to write about the Empire State Building unless I, I go there or I'm stuck there during a rainstorm. Uh, I'm not going to write about ball bearings, but I found this, and I, all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh, this was exhibited in the Museum of Modern Art in 1933. It's beautiful. It's not just everyday life. Um, so it, in many cases, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm talking to artists who often view manufacturing with contempt or like, oh, well, that's, that's okay. That's just everyday life. But the ball bearing is so phenomenal to me, and I'm going to have Allison pass around this little, uh, this little miniature SQF ball bearing that I received. It's not self-aligning, and self-aligning is another tricky thing. It's too tricky to describe to you right now. But um, it is uh, really the unit of, of modern life. If you have a bicycle, it's got ball bearings in it. If you drive a car, it's got ball bearings in it. Uh, it developed out of the textile mills, where because uh, buildings were subsiding, Sven Winquist decided to design a ball bearing that could actually move with the buildings. So as the buildings shifted due to vibrations from the machinery or just subsidence, the ball bearing could allow life to move on frictionless and speedy. And what's modernity about but going fast, right? So the ball bearing is this kind of fascinating thing that we can kind of recuperate, maybe. And I, everything else is too heavy to travel with or in Boston, so I always have to pass around something physical at a lecture. Uh, so this book, what's it about? Uh, in many ways, I'm going to talk about the book. I am also going to talk about the Collis exhibition, too. Um, it really looks at, at manufacturing and doesn't see factories in opposition to art. So hence my title, I Love Factory Art 2. I'm not asking you to convert or be, you know, change religions. I'm just asking you for, for a little more love for the world around you. And I have Allison to thank for this cover. It's my photograph. Uh, but uh, the, the cover is of, of this man. And you can see the book designers cut out his sweaty armpit. Uh, but he's Paul Rorig. And I met him because Allison invited me to come to Kohler, the factory. Uh, she worked at the John Michael Kohler Arts Center. Center did I say what that name? Uh, and um, they called me up and they said, we'd like you to contribute to a 40th anniversary volume about all of the artists who have come to work in the factory. And I said, OK, and I thought about it. And I said, well, how about if I, instead of writing about the artists, because they asked me, which artist do you want to write about? I said, what if I actually ask the people in the factory what they think of the artists, instead of vice versa? Uh, so it was fun to kind of shadow uh, Paul for, for, for a couple days to have him uh, talk to me about uh, his skills and, and the way he perceived his skills. Um, it, it's kind of remarkable to, to talk to someone who's, who, and watch them work, and, and uh, someone who's been working for 45 years at a, at a job. Uh, he's worked at different parts of the factory, but he's slip casting here. Uh, and this is a, another kind of eureka moment where I said, what's that? Because it was sticking out of his pocket. You can see there's another one. Uh, uh, he, and he, he pulled it out and he said, that's my signature. And it's out there all over the world. So this was the factory worker, not as a kind of miserable person who doesn't like drudgery, but actually who could discuss with me how, oh, you know, when he first got the job after five months, he thought he knew it all. But then after 12 months, he thought, no, he wasn't so skilled, actually. And he realized after four years that Really, he had learned so much more. Uh, and it, in some ways, it, it repeats the old adage of it takes seven years to serve an apprenticeship before you're actually skilled. Uh, and in many ways, to, to kind of pay homage to Paul Rorig flies in the face of most art history, number one, by going to the factory and talking to him, as opposed to sitting at a laptop or something in a library, uh, or only sticking to museums. But really, very deeply, most art historians, and beginning with the first person to ever have a, a kind of professorship in art history, John Ruskin, they absolutely said plaster casts are mechanical. They reduce people to, to mere operators. They're not skilled artisans. They're not, definitely not artists. 
And Paul's working with plaster molds. Uh, and yet, it's a very physical job. And it's also a very interesting job when you think about the molds changing all the time. The molds age out. You can only get 80 to 100 casts out of each mold. Um, and he actually starts learning the molds, pre-treating them here and there. That corner needs a, a dash of muddy water. That, that, that corner needs a little bit of talcum powder in order to coax the clay out. The failure rate is still quite enormous. Uh, for those of you who have ever visited factories where where there's a, a fail rate because the material, like ceramics or glass, is actually uh, uh, kind of uh, fickle and, and has a life of its own. Uh, that's where this is still craft to me. Uh, you know, to know the molds, to actually test the clay every morning and think, how is this going to behave today? How do I have to adjust my work? Uh, those are some of the kind of tricky and interesting ways in which this book, to me, was, was part of my own learning curve that I'm sharing with you. I would say this is how we usually think of factories. Uh, I like this recent image. In opposition to, to kind of culture, and as disturbing culture or ruining it. Rarely do you see the, the smoking uh, chimney as a, as a kind of image of, of, uh, of happiness. You know, right? it's, it's an image on, on, our, on our newspapers of, of China is, is, is burning too much coal, or uh, something's going wrong. But in the 19th century, it's wonderful. If you look at any paper published in Des Moines in the 19th century, they'd be thrilled to see a new factory opening uh, uh, and the image of, of a smoking chimney. Uh, most, most art history, actually, it's, it's actually uh, bizarre, but many authors still cite Modern Times by Charlie Chaplin as an image of factory labor, of, 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 of factory labor as drudgery and as dehumanizing. Uh, and I, we have a very cartoon concept of factory production, or none at all in art history, because art history is mostly focused on individual geniuses working in studios, not in factories. And in some ways, meeting Paul Rorig upended this little bit of uh, a kind of hierarchy for me. If we do have images of factories, it's like this. This is the Olympics in England uh, uh, in, in, in 2012. Uh, you know, using, you, turning it into a spectacle, uh, you know, four chimneys, massive gears, uh, uh, kind of uh, adaptive use of, 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 of factories that's, that's rather, again, uh, uh, theatrical and, and, and imprecise. Uh, my book is, is, is definitely not so original, uh, but it is readable. Uh, <laughs> and and it, it rests a lot and it owes its name to this earlier book by, by George Kubler, uh, who taught at, at Yale, uh, who begins his book with this wonderful sentence, let us suppose that the idea of art can be expanded to embrace the whole range of man-made things, including all tools and writing, in addition to the useless, beautiful, and poetic things of the world. Uh, and I, I think this is wonderful because uh, Kubler really is just saying, you can, you can love more. You can open the door to more for consideration. Uh, and so tools are, 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 and technology as a kind of theme uh, is something I'm very, very committed to investigating in my research, as I'll, as I'll show you. Uh, what he's also saying, in many ways, is that um, by thinking about tools, uh, we're, we're, we should look beyond uh, individuals. And, and that's one of the premises of my book, uh, if you go to an exhibition of Rubens, you should know that it's many different people working uh, on, on those paintings. Uh, and uh, many different contemporary artists, of course, employ many people. Some list their names, as you can see from your sculpture garden outside, uh, and some don't, right? Uh, what you can also see from Kubler's book is that he's got a, a, an Olmec uh, a jade on, on the cover. He was a... Uh, very interested in, 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 in post-colonial uh, uh, Spanish art uh, and looking for signs of, 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 of how it is more complex culturally. It's about cultural hybridity. It's not just about Spanish culture in South America. It's about cultures intermingling uh, um, and, 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 and production being much more complex. So uh, lastly, I'd say, this notion of, of tools really pushes you away from art objects. It think, makes you think about process, 
Some people like the term craft, some people don't. I don't really have a big hang up on it. I'm really interested in process, technology, tools. Uh, so here's Paul, uh, and, and this is the size, a very, very large scale, of, of the sinks he's, he's casting. Um, and, it, and, and, and it's kind of interesting to think about how this is very different than the usual image of the craftsperson in art, which I'd say is this, Vermeer's lace maker. Uh, Vermeer's lace maker really, I think, uh, is very attuned to Susan Collis's uh, uh, work because it has that same quiet, has that same focus. Uh, it might have a human instead of objects that you're relating to. Uh, it might have this, this, this focus on, on, on kind of a, almost a biographical window on someone's life. Um, but it's, it's in some ways lace making as parallel to painting, of course, too, this quiet, Craft. This is a person who only made 34 paintings his whole life, right? Um, uh, who's really focused on the slowness uh, of, of, of time. Um, in Vermeer's painting, we, we, we then might have a kind of parable for, for the artist, even if we don't have the artist himself. And I think that's very important in terms of, and again, another parallel between Collis uh, and Vermeer. So, Collis and everyday things. These are some of the, the, the magical objects that are upstairs, uh, which I'm assuming you've all looked at already. But these are, are, are really wonderful little you know, inlaid bits of mother of pearl, gems, uh, that transform these objects, uh, that enrich them, that bring them to a new level. But a level that's where? Is it in everyday life? No, I'd say it's still very much in the museum space, and, and that's curious, right? Uh, we have other people who are transforming everyday life. Uh, this is a man named Dominic uh, Esposito. I, I don't really love this work with all my heart, but I think it's quite interesting because it shows how topical it is, and I just came across it recently. Here's a, a, a kind of a quiet, a, a transformation of everyday life, but not a quiet one. It's, it's instead very loud, um, it's, it's ungentle, it's obvious. Um, but it's quite potent when, when the content is detected and you realize that he's actually done this as, as kind of guerrilla art and deposited this outside an opioid manufacturer in response to the opioid crisis. So like Nan Golden, who was very publicly challenging the Sackler family and saying museums shouldn't take their money, um, Esposito is, 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 uh, is, is engaging in activism. Being uh, uh, trained in design, I also look here when I see Susan Collis's chair. I don't know how many of you have seen this, but this is an incredible object that's in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It lives up to all my students' fears of decorative arts being lifestyles of the rich and famous and removed from their uh, world entirely and irrelevant to them. But when you look at it and you think, wow, it's kind of interesting, there's the whole room it came out of, quite majestic. Uh, it's made of, of rosewood with this lavish mother of pearl inlay, and that's why I connect this to Collis. Um, the whole room was, was, was decorated with, with, mother of, uh, with, with, with rosewood, uh, and it was the centerpiece. Uh, and um, the Herder brothers were, were these German-born uh, immigrants, came to, to, to New York to do well and did quite well, became a decorating firm. Um, and when you look at these objects, you can think that, oh, these stars are kind of, they're sprinkled across the, the, the table and they cascade kind of like uh, uh, Susan Collis's gestures of, of, of splatters. Uh, but then, oh my gosh, this is when you realize that the intentional programmatic nature of, of design and decorative art and what it can be, this isn't mere decor. What the Herder brothers have done here is they have taken the stars over the northern hemisphere as they appeared on the birth of William Henry Vanderbilt on May 8th, 1821. And it's turned into a desk for him to inhabit in the 1880s. Um, so, so, so this is not just any celestial field uh, and, and not just any stars, right? So this is one dramatic uh, 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 kind of juxtaposition where you can think uh, 
here's an object which, like Susan Collis, is trying to kind of give you a sense of the, the world. And I, I jumped past it, but if, if you look at the sides of the table, it's got that sense of, uh, of, 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 of you know, triumph at the four corners with, with laurel wreaths as well as you know, the good old Pan Am emblem of we own the world, and the Vanderbilts did. Uh, so so it, this was a kind of prestige object that, that really was ideological, and it's interesting in terms of a contrast to everyday life. This was not my everyday life, but William Henry Vanderbilt's. You can also play a fun game walking around the museum. Uh, you can say this is not a Susan Collis, this is a Richard Meyer. Um, and you can say, this is a Susan Collis, and oh, this is a Tom Sachs, and there's a kind of interesting juxtaposition of tools and machinery, right? Uh, this is a Susan Collis, and the Lee Montague, oh, good. And hopefully you're not tortured by my terrible addiction to being a professor. Um, so we can see earlier works in the Des Moines collection that I'd say resonate anew in light of of Collis uh, and, and the kind of, what is hardware? What are, what are tools? Uh, how, do, how do they inhabit our, our worlds? Um, how do they resonate? I mean, in, in, in many ways, you can say the whole story of art, according to Ernst Gombrich, and I, I kind of go with this, is, is really just about order and disorder. And the sense of order in life is, in many ways, what Collis is disrupting and what Bontecue and, and uh, Agnes Martin are disrupting. I won't, I wait for the quiz. So we rely on order in order to create disorder, but also in order to savor disorder as a kind of mode of individuality and intention. Uh, and I'd say, you know, you get juxtapositions like this, which, which are important in terms of the frame, the gilding, what it means. Uh, and here, I'd say Collis, comes closest to critiquing the, the, the kind of commodity aspects of the museum uh, um, uh, in a direct way that's, that's kind of refuting them. Uh, but it's interesting how lots of her work, I'd say, in some ways it, it, it's going to end up kind of like William Henry Vanderbilt's table. Not a testimony to one man, perhaps, but a, but a museum object, a hyper-enriched museum object. Um, you can look at other aspects of the collection and you can see some of her, her you know, I'd say the, 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 the spill and the crinkle are her, two of her, her major gestures that we can think about. Uh, and when I teach John Chamberlain, whose work I, I do love, uh, and, and scholars of John Chamberlain hate this, I say the reason those John Chamberlains are so beautiful is because the people at General Motors were artists and they were sculptors. So here you have an image of a General Motors sculptor making a full-blown mo model of a car uh, out of clay in 1954. And this is a practice that continues to this day. A man named Harley Earl came up with this notion that every car should be sculpted to size. So I have had students who went on to work at General Motors. Uh, and I think you can look at later John Chamberlain's and tell me if you agree or not. Uh, uh, once the, our cars were less beautiful as they are today, I'm sorry. Uh, if you disagree with me there, uh, and they became uh, made out of plastic and other materials, uh, Chamberlain was really kind of up the creek without a paddle, and uh, um, he had to change rather, rather uh, intensely. Um, so, so, you know, all of those, those graveyards of, of cheap cars and, and kind of the post-war affluence, that's part of John Chamberlain's story, and the sculptors at GM, too, are. So industrialization and, 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 and the factory is here. It's here too, right? Everyone know this work? So the Louis de Soto work, uh, you know, industrialization is really ubiquitous in contemporary art, and yet often either it's below the radar or it's a kind of subtext that artists visit as if they're tourists. But I would say we're not really, we can't be tourists. We can't afford to be tourists. We have to pay attention and savor that ball bearing and think of its meanings in relationship to these. And I don't think it takes down John Chamberlain down a peg to actually say, gosh, those cars, those tail fins made by Harley Earl were amazing in the 50s. Right? You can also think about a, a reversal of expectations. Here's a, a lovely bit of detritus I picked up off the beach. 
a little bit of sea coal. I never thought of, I knew sea glass existed before, but I found a bit of sea, sea coal that was polished by the, by the ocean and kind of basically sandblasted so that it's, it's, a, it's as beautiful as mother of pearl, uh, you know, or, or something else with that kind of absolutely uh, uh, gentle iridescence flowing out of it. Uh, so can we find something like this equally radiant of wonder, uh, or do we see the factory as kind of gloom, doom, or, or, or kind of darkness? Um, and the same way that I'm asking you to disregard the kind of boundaries of craft, art, and design, and let's move away from those safe havens that, that have been established categorically, we can look at this map. Uh, if the invocation of Native American land rightly feels us, makes us feel displaced a bit in terms of ownership, I, I think this should too, right? Because this is a map of the land that we're inhabiting, a geological map made in 1852, um, that looks at the land in terms of coal. Uh, so, so, so these are interesting ways you can use visualization to move beyond uh, uh, boundaries imposed upon you. One thing I know for certain that Susan Collis and I agree on is that brick walls are beautiful. Uh, so if you open my book, uh, you'll see the same kind of celebration of pattern and structure. Uh, and, and, and that's what I, I try to say when I, 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 um, I talk about how children who run alongside a sturdy brick wall and touch the narrow joints of mortar uh, between the, 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 the courses of brick, uh, kind of enjoy that meander pattern, enjoy, celebrate, and, and kind of apprehend the kind of essence of craft, and that we adults might do well to kind of go back to that memory uh, or, that, or, that, or that rhythm uh, that a child's finger might, might, might do. We might think of like, you know, the weight of the brick and empathize with the brick layer. We can do that too, that's okay. Uh, again, I'm a both and person, not an either or. Uh, we can also think about how the kind of the mysteries of mud and brick and mason and wall all come together. Uh, these are images of a, of a museum in, in Sweden, actually, where the architect invited the brick makers in the yard to decorate the bricks. So they, they depicted a trowel, right? Uh, they also put little crowns for, for the emblem of, of Sweden and waves and some nasty-minded uh, people actually depicted little wine bottles, too. Um, but uh, here, I love this because, you know, how, how postmodern can you get in terms of you know, referentiality and art about art? Here's a brick in a brick wall. Uh, um, uh, so, so there's a, a funny kind of language here and, uh, and a way in which hopefully we can look at objects like this and say, this gives us great tactile joy, and it even kind of oxygenates our life in this way to, 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 think, about, to think about human manufacturing as healthier for our minds than it is harmful for our environments, right? Um, so that notion of a celebration of manufacturing is what, was what I'm interested in with Rorig, and when he says that's my, that's my signature, it's out there all over the world, I think it's quite interesting because really he's saying, I'm alive today, and even if people have you know, done what Paul Rohrig has been doing for centuries, our history has yet to catch up to it. Uh, and even most craft historians really focus on craft as something that's in the past, that's historical. When you open up the dictionary, most dictionaries actually even give you that you know, description. Instead of saying, well, what if we actually listen to the scholarship that exists and say, most industrialization generated new crafts uh, and new crafts people. So my interest in kind of primary research, pedestrian research of going to manufactories and thinking, what's a factory that's interesting? Uh, is, is, is this, uh, uh, for one, uh, going to Wedgwood, an old manufactory? Uh, and what, what's happening there is Neil Bennett uh, is actually pulling a strap that turns a lathe that chisels clay. And so what you're seeing there is a magnetically attached chisel that's cutting into the leather hard surface. In the background, you can see, and maybe some of you know this, 
What Wedgwood is known for is that kind of rouletting or machining of ceramics. So there's a checkerboard pattern on that urn in the back. Tiger Woods has a few of those. They still make PGA trophies. Um, and this is a machine, but and it was described as a machine when it was made in the 1780s for Wedgwood, but it's not connected to any source of power except the human hand. So the hand has to know how to operate this. And however kind of highly refined the tool is, the human has to be attuned to it. So here's me, your, your kind of egg-headed professor, going into the uh, uh, factory. And Neil Bennett's giving me the chance to actually pull the strap. And if I pull too hard, which I didn't do, of course, first I pulled too soft, and it went backwards. Uh, and then if I pulled too hard, it chattered, the clay, chattered, like not shattered. Uh, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it didn't make a smooth, even cut. So the manipulation of materials and the attunement to materials is one of the things that the book is about. And really, it's also about building empathy with Paul Rorig, uh, Neil uh, 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 Bennett, uh, or, or other people in factories. Uh, uh, Mason and Hamlin is, is, a, is a piano manufacturer. Here is a man, uh, Li Sheng Yu, freehand cutting with a chisel. Um, so here, that, that does subscribe to what most people think of as, as craft being handmade uh, and actually uh, employing chance more often and not being machine driven. Um, to go back to inlays, I, I also visited Steinway and Sons and, and, and uh, Steve Meltzer, uh, whose work is illustrated in the book, um, and this probably should be redacted from the slide set because this is uh, highly, uh, 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 I shouldn't have taken this photograph. Uh, uh, it's intellectual property of the factory, and, and this is, 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 is now in, in the Middle East, this piano, but it was made for a commission, and it, it is a, you know, a million dollar piano that's been incredibly enriched with, with, uh, with, with Steve's hands, but also with, with, with uh, precious metals and, and jewels. Uh, on the other hand, uh, going into factories is also fun because you, you, it upends your, your idea of who's in the factory. Uh, nine out of ten commercials on television show you men manufacturing cars. If you go into Volvo in Sweden or if you go anywhere in the U.S., you'll find women engaged in manufacturing. And that's fascinating because that really confirms the story of the Industrial Revolution, which is that manufacturing begins with textiles and with women going into factories, especially in, in, uh, uh, in America and in England. Uh, so here's someone, you, you know, using their hands, using their hand and eye skill, right? Uh, um, the the, the uh, uh, academic Elaine Friedgood uh, uh, describes how, quote, handicraft and machine production once resided unproblematically in the same word manufacture. Uh, and in, for those of you who don't know Latin, uh, manu actually says the hand is in production there. Uh, uh, she continues, these were not antidotes for the other's poison. And so really, it, just like our crazy polarized political world, too often I'd say art schools uh, and artists themselves even uh, get into this notion of, 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 of saying handmade is quite different than machine production. Uh, and not saying they're the same at times, or they overlap. It, it's a more complex world. Uh, I, I, I'll, I won't make you do it, but I often tell students to repeat after me as if I were a preacher. I am a manufacturer, say it. Uh, because people get into all these cockamamie terms in terms of, well, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I'm a product artist. I don't know what that means. Or, or, or I'm an artisan craftsperson, like as if those two things weren't repetitive. Or, um, and then, of course, I've seen good dear friends get up and say, you know, I, I'm an artist, or I'm a sculptor, or I'm a craftsperson, depending on the audience. Uh, so it's a tricky thing, uh, craft. But manufacture really isn't. It's wonderful, and it opens up the world in a great way. And I would say, you know, manufacture really is something that's not given credit for its emotional weight in our lives. We would be twice as anxious if we didn't have standardization. Um, 
and this is one of my, my favorite examples, is I asked my students to imagine you know, their breakfast and, and what it would be like without standardization. Uh, if you did not know, you know what your orange juice was going to be, whether it was going to be some pulp, no pulp, or with pulp, would you actually viscerally have a response in your mouth? And that might sound kind of silly, but in that way, I'd say, you no, know, 10 times even more so, what if you went to the gas station and you didn't know what kind of, what kind of power you were going to get or whether you, what kind of dilution? Uh, uh, so we have emotional needs for regularity. And, and that, so that same idea that Gombrich talks about, the sense of order existing in art, we need that sense of order in everyday life. And this is one of the things I, I mention in my book. It's a wonderful uh, little object. Um, and and uh, <clears throat> it's, it's not about uniqueness. Uh, it's not about self-expression. I think we've had perhaps too much of an emphasis that creativity is defined in relationship to self-expression. <clears throat> Technology has always been our best hope for, for cheating death, uh, and perhaps not technology in terms of Apple stores uh, 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 and commodities like NASA gadgetry, but real technology, uh, baskets, metallurgy, um, you know, what, 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 what metal will, will, will tie a color to, 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 to cloth? Um, what shoe leather can withstand a 100-mile hike? Uh, and, and here, this little bit of technology is really just a brass slug that was made that's an extrusion die of sorts, if people know what that is. It's used to squeeze one material through another. We use extrusion dies for, for making tiles, for, for, for making lots of things, but we also use them to make pasta. So the joy in, in, in my factory tour here was visiting the Maldari factory in, in Brooklyn. There's only eight different pasta dye manufacturers in the country, even though there are dozens or hundreds of pasta manufacturers. Uh, and this little piece of pasta was called a radiatore, uh, which I love again because it actually pays homage to being part and parcel of the mechanized industrial world. It's what you have at home, a radiator, a core of tube with fins, right, that are radiating the heat. So this is a Maldari design, which is now made here uh, by, by uh, uh, Shop and Stop or you can go down market and look at how they call it ruffles uh, in, in other supermarkets. But to visit the Maldari factory was to also visit a museum where they had different forms of pasta and different molds and to look at how they historically had uh, supplied uh, industry uh, with, these, with these little molds. And, and some of those molds uh, are, are continuously you know, invented anew uh, to make a, a sun chip took 14 months in terms of R&D and getting like the chip to be the way the designer wanted it to be and the company wanted it to be, things like that, right? Those are the things we take for granted and yet we don't. Uh, you know, you open a bag of potato chips that's been smushed or, or you know, and you're miserable. Or, or, or uh, 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 you open a box of pasta and can you imagine if it didn't all cook at 12 minutes or at 8 minutes, as the box says? That's the sort of regularity and standardization that really is part of our, our, our worldview that's very much about stability and about uh, uh, industrialization being a good thing. And I think, especially working with students today, hopefully you're not as pessimistic as they are. Uh, a lot of people look on the Industrial Revolution as something that we need to, to, to move back or, or back away from uh, or even set the clock back. And really, um, it's, it's, that's a danger in terms of, of subscribing to that uh, because we're, we, we really can't, uh, and, and, and this sort of industrialization uh, has beautiful aspects of it, too, not just the sooty smokestacks. In my book, I'm really interested not just in factories, but, but in how broadly we can, we can uh, uh, define technology. Um, so I fell in love with basketry writing my book. Uh, it's really the lowest of the low in terms of crafts. It's, not in, in many museum collections. It's usually relegated to, to ethnographic uh, collections. Um, uh, you cannot find many art schools, and you can't even find many craft schools that have dedicated spaces to basketry. Uh, so uh, it, it was increasingly interesting to me as uh, something that was once part of our industrial landscape. So 
bucks to catch eels. These were massive things, right? Uh, that that were dropped into into uh, uh, the River Thames and then brought up. And you might look at this and think this is some kind of ancient Roman chariot, but this is actually a 1906 advertisement for a car body, right? So the interiors of our of our planes, basketry before we you know had aluminum and it was cheap or foam, uh, and basketry is astonishing in terms of of, of woven cups that can hold water. Uh, they're really quite remarkable um, as, as, as wondrous objects. Um, but then there's also large-scale basketry like this. These, this, is, this is a man in Rotterdam uh, who's, who's building a fascian willow mattress that will be part of a, a, of a dike uh, and a rampart of seawall, right, against uh, the rising tides of, of, uh, of, of, of climate change. So this is an ancient but really rather wonderfully uh, useful tool still, willow, and the har harvesting of willow uh, has been industrialized for centuries, uh, and it will continue to be, um, at least there in, in, in Rotterdam. So, so factory skills, like molds, are a way to fight entropy, but also it's a way to study entropy. This is an image of, of taking my students, from taking my students to a, 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 an, an electrical insulator factory. Again, drive down the road and you'll see how all of, your, all of our infrastructure still rests on porcelain uh, insulators up there uh, or glass, right? So these objects really are quite, quite beautiful, uh, quite elegant, uh, quite interesting. Uh, and if these fall flat to you, um, think, well, maybe, we, we, maybe we, we can actually look at how other people have, have seen them and have transformed them into uh, magical objects. So you can aestheticize these fragments of, of the industrial landscape, uh, but you can also, as Annie Albers did here, uh, uh, you know, turn them into a necklace. Uh, she's better known for, for her weavings. Uh, there she is with her husband, uh, Joseph Albers. But it absolutely takes this thing from everyday life uh, and, and turns it into something magical. Uh, her aluminum strainer necklace. Right, made with paper clips. Um, so again, this is someone who defined themselves as a weaver, as an artist. The Museum of Modern Art uh, had an exhibition of her work that described her as a textile engineer. Uh, she was both and. It's not either or. She was someone who could straddle these, 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 these diverse spheres. But it's all right if you're anonymous, too, I would argue. Uh, and here I'm going to introduce you to someone I call a ghost potter who works for industry, but you'd never meet him if you didn't have my, my book to, to introduce you to. So contemporary factories have, um, have done something interesting lately. They have perfected the mass production of seemingly eccentric forms, right? So they've got the suggestion of individuality. And here is Kevin Millward. Uh, who's an amazing uh, um, uh, on the wheel, on the potter's wheel. Uh, and meeting him in, in Stoke-on-Trent, where he lives, was amazing because he took me into a, a, a shop where, where, where would, you know, a factory shop, Port Mirian, that was selling hundreds of thousands of plates. And he said, look, I made that. I threw that. And so the old story of the factory displacing hand skills or eradicating, certainly, the wheel from the modern ceramics factory was quite different here. Uh, he can do many different types of, of craftsmanship. Uh, here, he's, he's being employed by Port Marion to throw pots that are then being branded as Sophie Conran's range. If you know Terence Conran and Conran's store, this is uh, uh, Terence's daughter. And I, I think it's very interesting that this is really being sold under a certain sort of country ethos uh, of handicraft. Sophie Conran is, 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 is saying how she uh, is, believes in living and enjoying every moment and creating a beautiful world around you uh, with simplicity and love. One life, live it well. There she is, uh, 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 and it's all about cooking, and it's all about a kind of home life and a sense of, of, of domestic ideal and this kind of rustic ideal that's driven 
driven art for centuries in terms of Rococo paintings, but also driven uh, things like ceramics as well. So here is, is a teapot. And when I say that this is uh, the suggestion of eccentricity, um, the marks of wheel thrown marks, of course, have been taken from Kevin's prototype and then transformed into a mold. Uh, and and uh, when Kevin first made this teapot, Port Marion said, can you add a little more wiggle to the knob? Can you, can you, can you bend it a bit more? Can you exaggerate it? Uh, so he can do this for them, but he can also do this, right? So that notion of, 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 a, of, a, of, a, of a potter uh, still existing in his workshop uh, and making things uh, by hand was fascinating to me. He held up a, a 3D printed cup and it said it took them all day to make that cup. So they sent it to him and he could make in one morning 40 different handles and 40 different versions. So he's faster than the 3D printer. So, so having faith in humanity as well as manufacturing is, is a good thing. Uh, his own pots, uh, it kind of explained to you why Port Marion turned to him. Uh, the, 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 kind of the mug on the right there is, is, is Kevin's. The mug on the left is Sophie Conran's, or is it Kevin's? I'm not sure. Or is it Port Marion's? I don't know. Uh, you get into this weird area where you don't know whether to identify the designer, manufacturer, and craftsperson, or how much credit you want to give and how many layers. Um, Kevin's own pot could never be slip cast because the handle is extruded. It's a tube which he then tears off. But you can't slip cast tubes because it's too complex in terms of mold making. Uh, it has to be solid, like Sophie Conran's cup. When he made uh, the, the, uh, the, the handle, he said to them, you've picked the wrong handle because you can't fit your fingers into it. He said, you know, try this one out. This is superior. And they said, we looked at it on the screen, and we've come up that on the web, which is how most people are going to buy this mug, it looks better that way. So the suggestion of, 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 of handmade and the suggestion of the hand is, is uh, obviously of primary concern. Uh, it's shipping, it's manufacturing, it's many different uh, uh, aspects. So the ghost potter is, is fascinating in terms of thinking that, you know, Stoke-on-Trent is famous in terms of it, it's like our rust belt. It's, you know, the industry has died, it's faded out, it's gone. Uh, and, and most of it's been relocated to, 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 to Southeast Asia. And yet, here is Kevin working on, uh, I'm not sure this will be true for generations, you know, it depends on whether we start paying people livable wages over there and it becomes more affordable to make things over here again. Uh, it's complex, but it's fascinating for me to discover that craftsmanship lives on in these different pockets where we think it's gone. So to be anonymous is OK. To be part of a whole constellation is OK. Kevin actually is very, very happy to be making the pots for Port Marion. He said, if it was just my pot, they'd never buy it. Everyone loves it because it's Sophie Conrad's. Uh, so he, he loves it. He, he's, he's happy to be part, again, a content to be part of, even if he thinks some bad decisions or some decisions he disagrees with, it's fine. Um, that's true of most designers. but. Uh, and, and craftspeople who are part of larger, larger uh, 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 kind of constellations of labor. And that's, again, something that my book is very much about. It's not people working independently, individually, all by themselves. It's about people doing what we talk about a lot, but usually don't do, collaborate. Um, and it's also about people really with precise skills and expertise uh, most of the things made in our, you know, most of the things made before 1500 in our museums were made by many skilled craftspeople working together. Uh, there was a dye specialist, there was a weaving specialist, there was an embroiderer, uh, but, but the embroiderer and the weaver were two different skills that they put together. <clears throat> I'm going to bring it more home now in terms of asking, you know, about something that everyone likes to talk about these days, IKEA. Now, many different museums, I even, you know, Sweden's National Museum does not have a banal piece of IKEA in it. Designers are furious over there. Uh, uh, and, and they should be, I think, because 
It's representative of everyday life. Um, uh, and, and, and this chair was interesting to me. Uh, in terms of pedestrian research, I, I discovered this chair um, shopping for, for a bunk bed for my children in Ikea. Uh, and I read the label and it said, oh, designed by Maria Vinca. I was like, this is curious. I'll just take a picture of that, keep going. Got home, send it, you know, does she, does she exist over there? Can I find her? Uh, and, then, and then the chair itself interested me. Um, uh, she, she writes, uh, or Ikea writes about her, the designer's thoughts. Uh, number one also, it says, this gentle rocking helps your body and mind to relax. Uh, and, uh, and other little bits said uh, things like that these were you know, very important to me. said, these are unique objects, one of a kind. They vary. And I thought, is this, is this Ikea salesmanship? Or is this, is this reality? Um, the designer uh, herself was wonderful, and I've, I've, I've stayed in touch with her, and I continue to work on her, uh, because I think she's, she's fascinating and, and really smart uh, uh, and inventive. She said, this is a chair you can actually sit on. Uh, she's also very, very short. She says, I hate Volvo cars. They're made for these tall Swedes and Scandinavians, and like I always throw my back out trying to reach the clutch. Uh, so, so here she's really designed a chair that's for her own petite physique, uh, uh, but that she also um, uh, wants to do so that it's, it's like children's furniture, which can stimulate very different sense, several different senses. Um, uh, and then she also used banana fiber because actually Ikea said, we have this material, banana fiber, make something out of it. And she said, I'm going to make a chair. Every, all these architects make chairs. The chairs are you know, very hard to design. This is very opportunistic of her. Ikea had not said, make a chair. They said, use banana fiber, come up with something. So she in, you made a chair, uh, and she made a chair that kind of, uh, for her, challenged uh, uh, many ideas by being small, by uh, also having this wide base so it rocks, so it can't tip. It, it's, it's good for children. Uh, it's low, uh, and it fit her body, right? Um, another IKEA chair, again, just to note, it says, hand woven, each piece of furniture is unique. You know, that's out there. Uh, there's nothing in the IKEA literature that is, is, is critiquing this or questioning this. And, you know, it's amazing that these things sell for $69, $169. Are they really handmade? Um, to, to continue my conversation with, with, with Maria Vinka via email and then Skype, and I'm very, very uh, appreciative of her, of her time, uh, she actually connected me to the, the factory producing this. Uh, and they were very skeptical of my intentions at first, but then they shared images of production and they shared the story of production, and it turns out, yes, these are all handmade. Uh, and much IKEA production is handmade in Southeast Asia. Um, I found it really fascinating to hear the, the uh, uh, factory owner's view of, of kind of what, what the factory was as a kind of, um, a, as an employer in terms of its ethics, in terms of what, what materials it was using. Uh, previously, rattan furniture had been soaked in diesel oil. So the thing that you think is natural maybe actually wasn't so natural. Uh, it was a technique of killing insects. Uh, he is, is very proud in terms of, of giving his employees health care and, and treating them humanely and having a kind of humane workspace. Um, but was, what was most fascinating to me was that most of these women were skilled in his eyes, and then also a lot of them were part-time farmers. So they were part-time farmers and part-time chair makers, which for me, as a historian of design and decorative arts, pulled me back to 1820s New England and thinking about farmers making hundreds of pairs of, of shoes in the winter. Uh, 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 and, and that's true of, 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 uh, of many different trades, not just, not just cord swainers, shoemakers. Um, so this is a, a kind of fascinating object. In fact, it is handmade. Uh, and to talk to Maria more, I said, what was, your, what was your inspiration? And she said, well, first, I was really designing something for myself. But after I made it, my father turned to me and said, um, it looks just like a, a casa or a guxi, which is a, a term for this uh, a kind of wooden ladle. And so this is a screen grab. I, I took of, of Maria making this drawing to explain to me what a casa was, because I had no idea. It's causa, but 
Um, but these are what they are. They're burl, burl uh, cups. Uh, and what was fascinating to me about these as well was that she is Sami, which is a, a kind of minority in, 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 uh, in Scandinavia. Sami kind of, they have been traditionally called Laplanders, but that's a kind of derogatory term. Uh, and to be Sami was really to, in, in, the, in Sweden's history and the history of Norway and, and Finland, was to be a kind of suppressed minority and not to be uh, uh, celebrated in terms of handicraft. And what Maria had done here is she had made a mass-produced object in Southeast Asia that was part Sweden, part Swedish, part, part, part Sami. Uh, and so there's kind of cultural heritage uh, that bubbles up inside of these mass-produced objects that are lingering in IKEA. So we really can't sell the world so short. Uh, and we have to also take them at their word that it's unique sometimes, at least. Uh, banana fiber is, is a, a waste material. That's why IKEA wanted to use it. So it, they're celebrating it as sustainable as well uh, and green. It also has a steel armature inside, so that's not so sustainable, but uh, you can't have everything. Uh, but this, this, this question of, of how we value craft as a kind of collective endeavor and how it really is still out there in our everyday world uh, is something to, to think about when we need to kind of move away from fetishizing, you know, crafts not just made by the individual maker and art and design are much more complex usually. And there's larger stories to unearth in terms of how people change and develop. Uh, there's famous glass makers, you know, whose, whose, whose uh, uh, work shifts when their body of assistance changes and that you can actually date, oh, those were the years when Bill was working for him. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> this doesn't mean uh, you know, that we should you know, not teach students to, to, to kind of engage in these craft pursuits. I think all the more so, like we need to, to, to retain them. And those skills are all transferable in kind of complex ways, I think. Learning to, to make a basket, I can tell you firsthand, is a fascinating mechanical experience in terms of order, in terms of tension of material. Um, uh, and it, it is kind of, of, of uh, uh, wondrous in a kind of really, um, really non-hierarchical and, and, and uh, uh, um, non-elitist fashion. So this, this game of, of focusing on everyday life is, is fun. Uh, I hope you're going to think more, having spun that little uh, uh, ball bearing about the, the beauty of a bicycle. Albert Einstein is very, very eloquent on the wonder of a bicycle, even to his lofty mind. Uh, and uh, as well as helicopters, automobiles, uh, uh, paper mills, textile mills. Um, uh, but also, of course, you have to think and, and think, gosh, it's just come back in vast numbers. I've just, I haven't just passed around a, a, a self-aligning ball bearing. I've passed around a fidget spinner. Uh, so that kind of joy that, that a child would take in the fidget spinner, you have to think of as a kind of mechanical delight that we have within us that we should think about. Uh, and this is the sort of craft that really does, as I say in my book, it lies around underfoot, uh, and yet it kind of oxygenates our lives. It gives us great joy and pleasure. Um, uh, and again, it does prove that human manufacturing as a kind of larger kind of you know, goal is wondrous and wonderful, right? When you actually, and this is what I mean by being positive and, and optimistic, when you look at how, how much labor people expended 100 years ago to, to, to kind of to, to light their house uh, versus the magic we have today of just this, this, this switch and how that light switch is, 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 is truly a phenomenal experience. When, when you're, next time you're sitting on the tarmac waiting for your plane to get off the ground, think, don't think, oh gosh, half an hour, this is horrible. Think, ancient Greeks would have died and gone to heaven to have this experience, right? And here I am uh, taking it for granted. So, so, so thank you for your time and patience. I hope you can, you can repeat it silently in your own head. I heart factory art too. But uh, I, I look forward to your questions. And, and again, thank you for your time.
And we will pass microphones on either side of the hall here. So if you would raise your hand, we'll get a microphone up to you. Lulu, I'm coming to you in the back. No, we, we, you can wait for me so then everyone can hear. Thank you, thank you. Uh, do you have any information about uh, which way the world is going in terms of artificial intelligence and robots uh, making things and uh, making the human um, obsolete uh, in terms of craft, or are we heading much more towards craft, humans, you know, engaging in, in craft uh, and the rest of us appreciating that more and supporting it more? I'm no prophet, so, uh, uh, but, but uh, I would say, you know, I think you've got, to, you've got to ponder it as a more psychologically fraught landscape, uh, but also it would be helpful if we actually pondered it more realistically. So, like in the last election, there was a lot of hoopla about people losing jobs, and it's automation, and it's been a gradual, you know, yes, we're going to, increasingly, automation is going to continue. It might get you know, increase customization, it might, uh, um, uh, I'd say, make for a better world overall, um, but it, it, it will increase. Um, there's just no buts, ands, or ifs, you know, no buts possible about that. Um, but we all, I think, should be quite, quite happy that this enlightenment project is continuing and we're uh, bringing electricity out there to, to people who didn't have electricity before. Uh, and, and bringing cups and clothing people and giving them shoes who didn't have shoes before. Uh, so so uh, that's on the one hand, you know, automation will continue. I think right now you're seeing a resurgence of interest in ceramics like Port Mirian is selling because people are anxious about the loss of the hand. Uh, and in a curious way, of course, they're not getting closer to the hand by buying the Port Mirian pot. Um, but, um, but they feel they are. And I think that the way people uh, um, consume things uh, really is, is, is a kind of fascinating story in terms of, of needing, needing to interrupt the order of, of everyday life uh, with, with, with disorder or with individuality or with the appearance of the unique, the appearance of the handmade, even if it isn't handmade. Um, I mean, what's a tie-dye shirt? Is it? It's like you know, it's mass-produced, but it's it's still it, it's not really handmade. Uh, and, and we have lots of different um, different uh, uh, kind of you know gray areas and, and 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 ways in which these have continued for a long time in terms of these these kind of we, we've they're not irreconcilable. I would say. Um, uh, I think that uh, looking at art schools. You know, I'm, uh, part of me thinks that I should, I should quit my job and I should, uh, I should try and get school children to, to, to uh, engage in basketry as a kind of lifelong mission because um, basically, you know, I, I see my children using magic markers and crayons and um, sheets of, 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 you know, bleached paper uh, and just think, what if, what, if, um, what if every school were just like growing willow on the side of the playing field? Uh, and the kids were actually learning to harvest it. And what if they were making things that they, not like waste paper baskets, that's like the only thing we have, right, at home, made out of basketry, uh, waste baskets and, and bread baskets. But what if they were making like, like uh, panniers for ba bicycles? Uh, what if they were like making things that they were exciting to them? Um, uh, I think that, uh, that that's in fact, it's a kind of, it's, it's one of the ways I hope things like that well, but I, hope, I hope one of the ways that, that craft, that we have more time to think about that and, and more ways to develop it. For me, making a basket teaches you geometry and teaches you, uh, 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 you know, about, about um, the, the uh, flora and, and, and nature and, and cultivation in a kind of fascinating way that, that then is, again, it's, it's not an individual, unique uh, 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 drawing like we see on the kind of gallery in your walk in here. Instead, it's usually like somewhat anonymous as an object. I, you can't tell my basket from your basket, probably, if we're both, both, both you know, making uh, uh, um, uh, baskets for the first time. Um, and that's what I mean when I say, you know, too often we think of, we thought of creativity in terms of individuality and uniqueness. Uh, I think 
if we if we back up and we think of creativity in terms of kind of you know traditions and you know either maintaining a tradition of making a basket or or learning how to make a form that other people have made for centuries before it's not boring actually you know uh, one of my favorite quotes I've heard recently is is this you know quote of Gustav Mahler it's tradition is not ashes and, and passing on of ashes, it's, it's the transmission of fire from generation to generation. Uh, it can be exciting. It doesn't have to be conventional and boring. Yeah, yeah. sorry, that was long with um, I just got back from Enseca yesterday, yep. so I still like, feel like I'm still at Enseca, which is the National Clay Educators yep. Conference of America. Anyway, so yesterday I also talked to Michael Sherrill, um, who most potters would not recognize his work, but they recognize his work because he's changed their work in everyday practice. We jokingly call this the red rib, rib period of pottery um, because of his manufacture. So I'm interested in finding out what you know about Michael Sherrill and, and you're interested in him. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was a lovely invitation to contribute to, uh, to a catalog about his work. Um, and he is... You know, in many ways, um, the exhibition, which I think is still up at the Mint, maybe it's closing soon, I don't know. It's going to travel, I think, um, uh, is, is, is pretty incredible for, for a personal journey of someone who is, in some ways, is, is really self-taught uh, and, and, uh, um, and also taught by kind of through apprenticeship and through kind of community learning more than traditional academic learning. So. He's fascinating to me on, on that level. Uh, I, I appreciate his work. I also, um, uh, when I first met Michael, I was blown away because he has, has a, a business called Mud Tools. Uh, and um, he makes tools for potters. But when I went to his studio, I saw you know, five dozen other tools that he had invented to make his own work. Um, and that sort of, of, of kind of feverish, brilliance of like handiwork was just you know that's my kind of that's where I love his work so when when it, when I first met him he, he gave me a few of these um, uh, tools uh, uh, which are made of silicone to kind of shape clay on the wheel uh, and I immediately said oh this is fantastic this is going to be an incredible way to you know these are great cooking tools to take camping so I can make my uh, 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 they're great pot scrapers uh, and he was like looking at me like oh gosh <laughs> But, but uh, I think there's, there's, there's a way in which his tools really excite me in terms of, of all of their possibilities as well. Uh, and that's what I think. So I, I love the art. And the show was a very traditional art show in you know, vitrines, objects, and cases. Um, and if you read my essay, I celebrate his little like spritzers and like different tools that he's developed. Uh, um, because I think those are the kind of um, those are the things that turn me on, I guess. Um, uh, in addition to, to, to his kind of you know incredible abilities to 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 you know both make pots, but also his more recent work is is really uh, is in, actually would be interesting to juxtapose with Susan Collis because it's 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 got this trompe l'oeil uh, kind of power um, and and brilliance and kind of the ability to to uh, to create you know rhododendrons that have kind of sat in the frost after they bloomed is is really you want to kind of eat them in a way, and they're beautiful. You just can't, they really are resplendent objects. Uh, and to kind of, you know, cultivate fallen nature really interests me too, in terms of just uh, 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 elegant nature. So thank you. I don't know if that, yeah. Other comments or questions? Do you have a question down here? Um, in your experience, whether it would be uh, visiting Kohler or the factory where they had insula made insulation for different power lines or things like that. Um, I, oh, sorry. Uh, as far as like your experiences with visiting uh, various factories, whether it be Kohler or um, installation factory where they made insulators for power lines and things of that nature, um, what what have your experience with these other people that are doing these crafts? How do they challenge the redundancy of doing those things? So as somebody works with their hand and they're doing the same thing over and over, yeah. how do they tend to overcome like the numbness of doing that? Yeah, 
Yeah, it's a it's an interesting thing. I mean, I think in some ways it's it's you know the the empathy I talk about in terms of having empathy for Paul Rorig, it's not that different than us. Uh, I'd say in terms of our everyday lives and like you know, there's people who like to cook and like to chop onions, uh, and there's people who find it like drudgery. Uh, and and I think that um, when you go into a, a, a factory like Cutco at, uh, up in Olean. I don't know if anyone has any Cutco knives. But I was talking to people who actually um, w were saying to me, well, in this kind of new managerial method, it's like they're rotating us from job to job. It's like, I don't like that. I want to stay put at the same job. <laughs> I like that predictability. So that sense of order is interesting. Some people like getting shifts, shifted around and having different tasks in the course of the day. and you know, the managerial guru who came up with this idea of, of, of round robin or, or musical chairs works for them, but it doesn't work for everyone. Um, and and uh, some of them are, you know, most of them I'd say, and this goes back to your question, most people who work in factories are thrilled about automation because it's taken jobs that they didn't like to do and which are generally simple and uh, uh, and, 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 and they don't see that as, they understand the future, they've got a sense of, of like the factory survival being paramount, uh, and it's, it's those places where management and you know, labor are on the same page that, that will survive probably. Uh, so, but, but this issue of, 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 of you know, repetition in craft is fascinating. I think it's, I think a lot of, you know, a lot of times I'm, I'm saying to students, wake up. Don't get that tunnel vision and just do this repetitive uh, uh, kind of uh, um, uh, action. See the larger field, right? See the space that you're inhabiting. See the larger constellation of objects that you're related to, or 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 uh, or, or or read a book instead of just doing, uh, right? Uh, so so it's it's a, it's an interesting uh, um, thing in a both in a studio setting and in a factory setting, yeah. I have a question for you, Ezra. I'm, I'm unhappy that you left Susan Collis juxtaposed with that god-awful herder table. <laughs> because I, I don't think that's fair to Agnes Susan. Martin work. too. Tom Sachs. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, you kind of, uh, and maybe I'm misunderstanding, but you kind of isolated her in the, you know, the, um, uh, the individualistic kind of artist, fine artist kind of category in a way. Um, but I feel like a lot of what her art is talking about is actually what you're also talking about. Um, it just happens to be in a museum. I mean, because she's very much talking about collaboration and like Bespoke is a really great example yep. of, of just that. Um, so I just wanted to, to um, kind yeah. of push you on that a little bit. Yeah, 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 it's fine. I don't share with you the disdain for the herder. I, I think that's the real difference. I love that herder table too. And so it, it's not my life. You know, I'll, I'll never be a Vanderbilt. Um, <laughs> but, but, um, but I think that table is, again, it's, it's the wonderful story. I, I look at that table and I see, I see this like immigrants coming to America, kind of working in whatever style that their patrons need being inventive, um, uh, again, uh, no one made you know, tables with, that were that enriched. Those were probably, that's the high point in terms of collaboration of craftspeople in America, in many ways, is the Gilded Age, um, when you know, America had never made tables like that before. That's our one moment where we can say, oh, we had a little Versailles going, you know? Uh, <laughs> and you can hate it or loathe it, and that's fine. That's about taste. Um, but, but to me, it's, 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 it still is quite a, an authentic object. And I, 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 so I see Susan Collis's work as very authentic. Um, but, you know, I, I, I do see it as this kind of um, a hyper enriched object, unlike the ball bearing, which I'm just saying, you know, love that too. Again, I, I'm not, I'm not critiquing. Uh, Susan Collis in a kind of negative way and saying she's, she's like the herder table in terms of its, of her content at all. I think you're exactly right that she's about, you know, meditating on the everyday, um, meditating also on her own. I think her work is very much about 
about her life in London, and like you know, if you if, as as the catalog and the, and the interviews to Tess, it's like a, 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 a door she sees in the trash becomes part of her work, and so that kind of way in which you're you're paying attention to the garbage, uh, or what other people see as garbage, yeah, you know, is, is and, and then recognizing that it's not, it's actually a document of our world and our life, and is worth recording, um, you know. I think you know probably we'll look back on some of the hardware she makes, and it, it'll be a document of our time. That's instead of being below ground archaeology, it'll be up here, you know, and sitting in a case. And people, you know, are we all going to know what you know drywall screws look like in 200 years? Uh, my, my children can't; they already can't recognize what a typewriter is, or a photograph of a typewriter by Tina Madotti. They don't see as a typewriter; it doesn't leap off the page. Um, yeah. Ezra, but, we have one more question over there. Uh, yes, I just, I think I had a bit of an aha moment with the previous question about the relationship, you know, what, what is a person who does a routine job in a, in a, in a production factory, um, what is that interest, what is that commitment to the craft or the, um, the art or the, both of those things together as they, as they take shape. And I got to wondering, and I was thinking, reflecting, there were a few years in the 1970s when we were looking for teaching jobs and there were none to be had when, when my husband and I worked in a factory. We actually um, worked in a factory that my dad managed, which was a very interesting kind of experience. Um, but there, and then we became artists. We were, you know, my husband is still working as an artist and I went on to do other things, but we ran a pottery for 12 years. and so. We've had that experience as well. And I think um, there's a similarity and a difference in those two endeavors. I think it's when you're working in that production setting on an object that maybe you didn't have any involvement in the original design, there can still be an incredible commitment to the quality and the integrity of the product that you're engaged in, in putting together. But it's, it's a different kind of commitment in a way, and yet it's the same. So th there is something to be said about the beauty and the usefulness of something that you're, you're working on, whether you're doing it as a, as a fine craft, or as a work of art, or as a production piece. And so I think, it, you know, I think that there's that interesting change, and I was really interested in the notion that um, through, auto, through automation, so when you have, so when you're bringing in the um, artificial intelligence and the, the more advanced technologies into that, what does that free you up as a person working in that place to think about and think about differently? Yeah. Just a... I think, um, you know, there, there, I still, I still think there are gray areas that these, we've sorted these out too much. So, and, and I'll just say like, you know, for instance, my last, you know, example would be when I went into to Kohler again. Um, there are these these these. You, you walk in and you see these sinks that are shaped like like rays, like a fish, like you know, they're curved like this. And then in talking to the the people who are working with the designers, they said to me, "Well, you know, the designers came up with this thing, this shape, and then we've got to figure it out in the block and mold shop." And so. Lots of people at Kohler said, you know, unauthorized changes <laughs> were part of their creative output, in a sense, right? So I'm not saying all factories are interesting. I think everyone knows that, right? There are factories, and then there are interesting factories, let's say. Or there's production, and then there's interesting production, just the same way that, like, you know, using a mandolin can be a lot more exciting than just chopping an onion with a knife, right? It can also be more dangerous, but it can be exciting in terms of you can taste it as well, uh, the, the, the difference in, in how you're changing the texture of food. Um, and so I just think that I know my students are, are, are taught from a very early age, just like I was, that when I make a drawing, I should sign it and pin it on the wall, and that that's authorship. Uh, instead of thinking collaboratively or in more complex fashion. Um, so I think that, you know, I am Pei came up with this texture of this kind of corduroy, um, he didn't invent it, other people made it too. But when you look at, I love this kind of 
mid-century architecture, you can look at lots of different buildings where casting the concrete and coming up with different textures was done in many different ways. And all corduroy concrete walls are not the same. Uh, and some of them have different levels of skill and some of them don't, but often it's not just the architect's decision. And this is the exciting thing about beautiful buildings and beautiful bridges, uh, is, that, is that you have collaboration and you have a, a kind of a, a builder uh, and an engineer and they're determining what concrete to use and what casting process and what tools and, you know, in, in, in ideas and invention sometimes in those complex webs of design do bubble up in different ways from, you know, not the traditional author, right? So um, that's my overall thing. Again, it's Isla Heart Factory Art 2. It's not, it's not rejecting um, uh, uh, anything. Um, Ezra, thank you so much. Thank you. Yep.